Um, this is Being Church with ELCA Coaching. Uh, welcome to our 39th online gathering for congregational leaders across the country. Um, I'm Jason O'Neill, Senior Administrative Support for ELCA Coaching and one of your facilitators today. Uh, it's important for us to be reminded that this time is meant to be a safe and brave space for the people of our church to bring the truth of who they are and how they are doing. These conversations are an intentional step to live more fully into God's dream for us as the body of Christ. We're honored and excited to have Jory Michelson with us today. I didn't actually, did I say your name right, Jory? Is it Michelson or Michelson? Michelson. It's Michelson. Fine. Okay. <laughs> when social justice issues meet the church, what does it mean to practice allyship? A writer, educator, and ministry leader, Jory has a passion for building connections across difference and promoting neighborliness and solidarity. Jory, thank you for being with us. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm currently um, talking to you from Taos, New Mexico. Um, I'm on a, a three-month uh, artist residency where I'm working on my second book. So um, it's 28 degrees and gorgeously sunny outside, but still very chilly. I think our, our low tonight is going to be in the teens. So, um, And that's after a day of... Uh, hail and thunder and snow all in the same day. So it, it was quite a show yesterday. I'm, I'm glad because the internet was flickering yesterday and I was like, oh, I hope it's better today. Um, so uh, I am, when I'm not here, I am uh, a, an entrance candidate in the uh, Northwest Washington Synod um, for Word and Sacrament. Uh, I live in Bellingham, Washington, and um, most recently I worked as a um, as pulpit supply on an ongoing basis for a church that was closing its doors, and what we thought would be like a two-month situation ended up lasting for almost a year, um, so that was, that was really unexpected and challenging, and um, wonderful as well, and also um, I, I work with Echoes in Bellingham, which is a church plant, sort of church outside the box. And um, we have been going for about six years now. We had, up until very recently, we had four ministry leaders, um, all from coming from different congregational backgrounds. So the, the founder is a ELCA Lutheran pastor, Sheriff Weathers. Um, there's Emma Donahue, who's a Methodist minister. There's myself, who comes from an Episcopal background. And there uh, was Victoria Lors, who's the founder of the Wild Church Network. Um, and she comes from independent church background. So um, up until recently, in, uh, Victoria was leading our Wild Church Initiative, and she had to step away um, as, as her responsibilities with Wild Church increased. So, um, and, one, and so we, we don't have a building and um, we do different, we do four or five or six different activities every month um, that may or may not look like church to people. And I think one of our most successful and one of our um, most confusing as church might be uh, what we call um, hamster church. And uh, I live in Bellingham, and so locals are known as Belling hamsters. And so uh, once a month, we conduct uh, an Oprah Winfrey style interview with a member of the community who we would not normally meet um, in church. And so this could be any anyone we've had so far from Bellingham's um, legendary uh, drag queen who's been giving drag shows in Bellingham for 20 years to um, our most recent guest was the um, executive CEO for the Lighthouse Mission, which is the only help homeless shelter and resource in Whatcom County. And they're going through a, a brand new big build um, right now. And so, um, you know, we've had members um, of the community who are unhoused, who are in an alternative housing that the city had provided to talk about the village they had created. Um, and this is all founded on, on the principle that um, it's very important that we get to know our neighbors and that we work with people across difference. And so, you know, we have, we have quite a, a wide range of religious belief or no belief at all, as well as, um, you know, um, so, so, and this is all founded sort of on Walter Brueggemann's concept of neighborliness and working in solidarity with the people in our community. And I'm happy to speak more about that, but 
but really um, we didn't expect it to be so popular with the community, but, but really whoever we're speaking to brings all sorts of new people into contact with us their friends, their fans, their relatives, and their families. And so um, we really meet a huge cross-section of people in Bellingham and Whatcom County that we would normally never get to encounter. And so, um, and, and it's sort of spawned um, some reciprocity on our part, um, where sometimes we do fundraising for them if we can. Uh, sometimes we work with them on a project. I think one of the most interesting things that we've done is um, the local Buddhist community. We had um, one of the, the founders from the local Buddhist center come and speak with us and talked about how Buddhist meditation and Christian meditation are similar and different from one another. And um, we had an extra Monday night, so we went and sat in a, in a Dharma talk at the Buddhist hall um, because people from their community had come to, to hear our talk and we had gone to hear their talk. So it was a great opportunity to show neighborliness and um, to talk with people that we would generally never meet, especially if we're in a more traditional church setting where um, we spend, you know, spend a majority of our time waiting, sometimes waiting for the world to come to the church without realizing that often we need to be taking the church into the world. And so, um, you know, we've been outside the box. We don't have a building um, and we host a number of events in, in community. And so we're, we're encountering people in ways that maybe traditional church didn't need to do. Um, and I didn't, you know, these, and our, our ministries and our things evolved over time. So, but before I get too excited and start talking endlessly, um, I, I thought I would uh, welcome us all with a um, poem from Rumi, um, the poet, come, Come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving, it doesn't matter. Ours is not a caravan of despair. Come, even if you have broken your vows a thousand times. Come, yet again, come, come. And let that be our prayer today, too. I feel like so often with the way things are it can be so easy to be a caravan of despair or that the news <laughs> always seems like a caravan of despair um but come come again and be welcome uh, when i first got into allyship and and social justice work um wendell berry offered some very comforting words the the poet farmer and philosopher and he said it may be that when we no longer know what to do that we have come to our real work and then when, when we no longer know which way to go we may have come to our real journey the mind that is not baffled is not employed the impeded stream is the one that sings and i think so often when i when allyship is presented, it's like a big hurrah that, that we're working across this rainbow of solidarity for whatever that's going to look like. And um, so often that image of like working with people is, is really glossed over as positive, but it can be baffling, um, it can be frustrating, and there's so many obstacles that we're going to face. Um, and that's been true for my work, and I feel like like any picture that doesn't um, employ that isn't telling the whole story. And I have a little PowerPoint. Um, let me pull that up and then I'll do a screen share if I can. Um, okay. And then, there you go. And thank you for my, um, okay, so today's talk, uh, for lack of a fancy word, allyship principles and practices where social justice meets the church in the world. Um, so how, so how did it start for me? Um, well, as a, it, as a, a queer person living in rural Montana where I grew up, um, 
activism sort of came hand in hand with with living my my truth. And in the mid '90s, when I came out uh, in Montana, uh, being an LGBTQ person was still considered a felony. Um, and so there was a movement in '97 um, to repeal um, the, the felony law on the books in Montana, um, and it it went all the way to the Montana Supreme Court, and it was it was quite an ordeal. And I came out sort of in the midst of all of this, and quickly got involved in in activism in rural Montana. Um, in a really dangerous and volatile time, and so so that was that was my entrance into doing like direct action and marches and all that stuff, uh, petitions like anything that you would sort of associate with social justice work. Um, in the '90s, I, I was involved with that in in rural Montana, and um, you know as things became more comfortable and acceptance was more broad, um, you know, I was like, well, good job. I patted myself on the back and I said, I think we're done here. And so like I went on living sort of the privilege of my life and, and relative comfort. Um, and I moved to, to Western Washington where we live in this tiny blue bubble that I'm usually super happy to be in. Um, and, and I mean, there were things that, you know, it wasn't like I was like doing a lot of social justice work on the streets like it had been earlier on. Um, and then in 2017, I started working for Northwest Indian College as a writing, ment a writing tutor and student mentor. And um, it's a tribal college. And it was through a program that helps first-generation college students, uh, students below the poverty line, and uh, students that would face uh, disadvantages. And, and unfortunately, um, most indigenous students all three of those things. And so my, my center of, 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 and I had tutored students um, when I was in graduate school as well. And so, you know, working in rural Idaho with predominantly white rural students was radically different than dealing with, with um, uh, a tribal education system. And they had just gone through re-indigenizing the, the tribal system. And so the school is founded on the four principles of Coast Salish people. Um, and there was, there was a lot to learn. Um, and I suddenly realized, or I was told that I was a guest on tribal land. Um, and so it, you know, I very quickly, my identity that I had taken for granted, granted was decentered. And I was entering a world where um, not a lot of people looked like me, um, you know, uh, people from and indigenous students from all over the Pacific Northwest, from Alaska to Montana to the Midwest, and you know, a lot of different cultural practices and beliefs and ways of living that didn't mesh with what I had grown with what, what I had known. So, um, like, uh, you know, for, for many indigenous people, um, direct eye contact is a sign of disrespect, especially if they perceive you to be an elder. So you never make eye contact, you never look at them. So, you know, in my way of dealing with people, I'm very used to like eye contact, we're looking at each other. Um, and then suddenly I'm dealing with students that like won't make eye contact with me. And I don't even, you know, so even, even nonverbal communication is different. And so um, that began my education for the next three years about, um, be, becoming an ally to indigenous communities um, and working in an educational system where I was a guest. Um, and then in 2017, there was also Ferguson protests, uh, DAPL or the direct action uh, for the Dakota Access Pipeline and the Water Warriors, which became central to Northwest Indian College um, with, with an Indian population. And we also had the Women's March. So there was this huge explosion of, of of, of we might call them issues or, or contemporary problems. And, um, you know, suddenly it wasn't centered around, um, you know, I'm passable as like, you know, with all of my privileges, male identified, um, white, um, middle class. And so suddenly, like all these things that I had just moved through the world were suddenly, um, I was other than the central issue and learning how to work well with and for other people became really important. Um, and so that's sort of 
where my thinking started to really evolve and, and I learned much more deeply how to work as an ally um, or, or try to be a better ally. And so those were sort of my impetus. And I'm sure that, that many of you in your own congregations and in your, in your own lives have experienced some of these things more recently. Um, and sometimes, you know, it's like, I want to help, but I'm not actually sure where to start, or I have a ministry that's working with these populations, and it's like, I'm not sure if I'm doing the best thing that I could, or I'm receiving some flack, or I'm being told that I'm the enemy. So, like, how do I work, you know, with, with these populations? And so, um, for, for this allyship, for a working definition, um, an ally isn't an identity. Like I wouldn't say, I wouldn't claim say I'm your ally, um, but a practice or a process. Um, and it became really important for me to understand in my work that um, being allyship or being an ally isn't self-defined. You have to be named and claimed by those that we seek to ally with, much in the same way that a call within the church you know, God names and claims us as his own through baptism, but then it takes the, you know, a congregation to affirm our call to ministry. Um, it's not just, it's not just like, oh, I have a call, and the church says, oh, you have a call, and then suddenly you're a pastor or a deacon. Um, you need a congregation to affirm that within you, and much in the same way when we work with allyship, we, those that we would seek to ally with, um, they need to claim us and call us and name us an ally to themselves. And so that, that was a big revelation to me in the community that, that I couldn't just be your ally. Um, like, well, I want what's best for you and I want to work with you. Um, but, I, you know, I was quickly told, at least with indigenous people, um, that's not going to fly. Like, you know, we have to, you know, we need to see the receipts. Um, like Black Lives Matter movement, they're like, where are your receipts? Um, and so different communities have different ways of speaking. But I can participate, but that doesn't always mean I'm going to be seen as a helpful participant in the world. Um, and lastly, um, an awareness of my own privilege and power and bringing the benefits and advantages that I'm living by and with to work on in solidarity with others. And that takes some time to puzzle out. So for some of us, that might be um, you know, like our social media presence, if we have a big social media presence, um, or if we have resources and networks within the church um, with other local agencies, using um, our resources, even with, you know, our established networks, how can we bring our presence, um, our privilege, and our networks of support to bear working with and for the communities that we seek now? And that might seem like, well, yeah, you know, it's like we're doing this ministry. So yeah, that's um, not news to us. But so an awareness, but really, instead of viewing our resources, um, changing how we view our resources to our advantages and our privilege and our power. Um, because really, for a long time, maybe less so today, but in the past, the church has been a power and a presence and an institution and often a participant or an inflictor of the oppression of the system that we're seeking to do our justice work outside of. So um, viewing, you know, viewing like, oh, I have this huge network or, you know, but also saying, is this a resource or is this something that might have been oppressive in the past or continues to be oppressive in some way is one thing to look at. Um, so what are the some basic principles of good allyship? Um, and this, this can be, um, one, we acknowledge our own privilege and power openly and discuss them and how we benefit from them. And this is really, you know, key because um, I have a friend who does a lot of work with um, class in Seattle. And Seattle, if you don't know, is undergoing massive gentrification. Uh, people are being pushed out of their traditional neighborhoods. Um, they can't afford to live there anymore. And... Uh, Seattle people are great in discussing issues of gentrification, but very few people seem to want to identify that they're middle or upper middle class. And there, there's something about shame about, about that, like, oh, let's work, but, you know, without ever wanting to own or recognize our own privilege and advantage. And so part of being a good ally is not being afraid to openly discuss 
our our privileges, our advantages, our you know, um, or how we've participated in oppression in the past, even unconsciously. Um, another principle is allyship is more about listening than speaking. It can be easy in our ministry work to run into like um, Bellingham is undergoing a, a significant problem with homelessness, right? And so we, you know, we meet on our church councils or with our congregations and decide, okay, this is the ministry that we are going to provide to relieve, um, you know, to help relieve this crisis of, of homelessness that we're encountering in our community. Um, but how often do we actually talk and listen to the people who are homeless um, or unhoused and, and what their needs are? So another good principle of allyship is that we hold back our opinions, solutions, and ideologies. We resist the urge to save those we seek to help. And that can be really, like, of course we want to help and we want to do its good, but we often just reflect on, oh, I'm going to do good and this is what we're going to do without actually um, listening. And so I feel like listening is key. And in my work in the LGBTQ community, um, yes, I'm a queer person, but I'm also in uh, organized religion. And so um, my, my first principle is often to listen to those that we seek to help because so often I see signs on the outside of churches that say, let love be our legacy. And part of me thinks like, that might just be the what we chisel on the gravestone of the church. Like, let love be our legacy, um, you know, and we say, well, you know, well, we're reconciling in Christ or we're doing work in the community. Um, and then you attend the church and there's no LGBTQ presence in the church, even if they're friendly. And it's because it's like, okay, we're, we're open and accepting now. And that's as far as the work as the church has ever gone, but we've never actually gone and listened to what another community might need from us. And so um, that that's one of the key things about listening more than speaking, um, hearing opinions, solutions, and ideologies rather than offering it our own in the beginning. And that that has been key in my work. Um, and the, the extension of that is we trust that those we seek to help um, with adequate support and resources will determine the solutions that best meet their needs. We learn to take direction and guidance. And I think um, that us as ministry leaders, as um, religious leaders can be so, we, we just don't tend to think about it. I mean, I come from the Episcopal tradition, which is very top down. So if you're the priest at the church, um, you get a vote on council, you kind of direct the council about how it's gonna go. Um, and so there's very, um, the idea of leadership, it's like, well, I'm the leader of the church and or the council is the leader of the church and um, or this ministry or it's like I'm doing the work of this ministry primarily. So um, but the idea that that the people we seek to help are actually going to offer us solutions to their needs um, and what's going to best meet their needs. And the question becomes, how can we as allies to that community or to those people um, help them meet their self-determined needs. And often um, what we envision for help for other people may be radically different from what they see as help. And so part of this is, we'll get to it as decentering. Um, we learn to take direction and guidance and we learn to trust that, that God will be with us in the work, even if we tend to disagree with, or um, there seems to be a conflict. Um, I trust that generally, God is bigger than my limited vision, and I am trusting in the process, which is very difficult for someone like me. Um, you know, we also learn how to better receive criticism, become accountable, and being called out for our mistakes is part of the process. And, and one of the things I love about my Native friends is that they have super cutting sense of humor and are sarcastic, which feeds very well into my own sense of humor. Um, and, it, you know, but it could be really cutting and, and, and I've gotten my feelings hurt several times. And it, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like they weren't my friends anymore. Um, but, but I've been called out and I've made quite a few mistakes. Um, and I had to realize often that within indigenous communities, 
when they make fun of me, there's a lesson to be learned in that making fun. Um, and in that, that it just wasn't to like make fun of me or belittle me, but often they were also handing me an important lesson for me to learn. And so, um, you know, sometimes it can be fruitful. Like, I don't know if I really want to like go and be with these people because they're often contentious or, you know, I heard there's a lot of drama at the meetings and I don't want to be a part of that, or it's just too exhausting to be around them. And often the drama or the exhaustion comes from me not willing to be open to the experience, to the community, and also not willing to let go of my own ideas and beliefs and, and structures. And so it can be really hard on my ego um, to be like, I'm here to help you. And then to have someone say, nobody asked you to come. Like, what do you do? It's like, nobody asked you to come. Or like, yeah, we don't need your help. Thanks, you know? And sometimes my active participation um, can be as a witness um, as a bystander or as someone who's going to listen and grow in the process. Um, and I've, I've made a lot of mistakes and, you know, some are embarrassing. Um, you know, and the next thing is that we educate ourselves and we don't put the expectation or the burden, um, on the people that we seek to work with to educate us. And that can maybe seem contradictory. It's like, well, how else am I going to learn about this community? And it's really, the, the work of educating ourselves falls to us. And so if we want to help with homelessness in our community, we need to go ahead and learn about homelessness in our community. Um, because it can be it can be exhausting to people to have to continually educate people about it. And so the, the simplest thing I can think of is as an LGBTQ person, I am more than happy to share my experience with people. But it, if I have to correct every incorrect thing that people say to me all the time, I, I just I just can't do it anymore. Like it's just it's just too exhausting to like sit down and have another conversation about this. You know, I might say something. I said I don't know if that's exactly right. You might want to learn more about that and just leave it at that. Um, but I've really like. I always thought that when I would do work in a community, it was up to them to educate me, and most often. Um, they're engaged in the work of survival and it, it can be too exhausting for those people or, or they're in crisis. It's not their job to like sit down and have a calm, enlightening conversation with me or direct me to some resources, um, you know, to educate me. Um, it's often my initiative, you know. And so for the tribal college, that meant sitting with some of the elders at the college and just saying, hi, um, you know, I'm... I'm new here, I'm a guest. What do you think is important for me to know? And then just sit there and listen. And it's considered extremely rude to interrupt an elder. And so I would get, I would just have to clear my schedule and go sit. Um, and sometimes it went on far longer than I wanted it to, like a couple hours. And that's just like, that's just the nature of the thing. I asked to be educated and so, um, that was on me to go do that work. No one was going to take me aside and said, you're doing this wrong and here's what needs to happen. And, and finally, um, we expect that we're going to experience a range of emotions in this work, including discomfort and anger and hurt. Um, often in doing anti-oppression work, um, in the past, it's been like, I'm here to help you. And they're like, get lost. Uh, or like, like, there's a lot of anger towards institutional church, which I just happen to be the representation of, um, especially in the LGBTQ community. Um, like they, like I, you know, I don't blame any any LGBTQ person for being angry at the church. There's, there's just the entire history of the church, given like the recent uh, openness and acceptance uh, and welcome of the church. There's a lot of anger that. I need to receive a lot of hurt that I need to hear. And, you know, I just need to be a presence and sometimes an apologizing presence and sometimes a, a target to receive that woundedness. And so um, 
they don't really talk about that. <laughs> you know, it's like we're going to do work in the community. It says, okay, get ready for anger and hurt. Like I've never heard anyone preface the ministry with like, let's do God's work in the world. Let's, okay, get ready for anger and hurt. Like that just wasn't part of my 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 initial welcome to this work. And so, um, you know, we expect that we're going to run a whole gambit of emotions um, in doing this work, and and that's that's part of the process, and that's part of being good allies to, to. I mean, I don't know if you can be prepared to have someone blow up on you, and I'm sure we've all had someone blow up on us. But but the key to realize that this too is part of the important work of of being an ally is to 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 be able to receive. Um, and and finally, allyship is a is a process of decentering, and in church language, I would say. We think of it as less and less as providing services to a community and more and more as becoming a servant to the community. And so we talk about that servanthood, um, but so often we can get so wrapped up into a, a budget for a ministry or a list of services, or it's like, you know, we we feed the homeless sandwiches on Monday and Wednesday, and that's that's our ministry. And, you know, and we really, like, this is what we do, and this is how we've been doing it, and it's been a good ministry for 10 years. And sometimes we close ourselves off from the call to see how we, how the the communities we seek to help might might better want our help. Maybe, maybe there's a different day that works better for the need, or maybe they want something else, you know, but us being open and learning how to decenter ourselves and our identities and our work um, to be able to do the work, you know, is key in allyship. Um, so it, the first is to listen, uh, resist the urge to provide solutions. And I think in listening, the most important thing I've come to see is respect the lived experience of others. Because, you know, working with indigenous communities, working with the LGBTQ community, working with uh, Black Lives Matter, in my community that's largely white, um, their experience is going to be radically different than my lived experience. Um, and I have to, ex and I have to like respect that they have truth. Like, like one of the things that um, is so difficult for me in doing, in talking to uh, really like church people about the LGBTQ community is they're like, you know, we're, we're welcoming now. And it's also like, well, they just need Jesus. And it's like, of course they need, they need Jesus. But maybe they, you know, maybe um, the LGBTQ community has some lived truth and experience that we don't have access to. And we need to hear what that is and honor and respect that um, because we, we don't live inside that sphere, you know? And so like the values of, of diversity and living, live truth and, you know, like whatever the community is, they're going to have experience that they that's true for them, and that they survive by, um, and that they abide by. And learning how to respect and listen to that is some of the most important work we can do, and has been some of the most rewarding. Um, you know, and the second is ask: How can we best or support or provide resources for those that we seek to work with? Um, you know, and it often. In that asking, it doesn't say, you know, it's not just about money. Uh, it's just not just about like, okay, you can use our building, but you know, to really ask you like, you know, we have some resources. What are some of your needs and where can we meet up in there? You tell me what you need from us rather than we go, here's what we're going to provide you. Like, a meet, like often I feel like church says, well, you can meet at our place. So like, we're happy to like host this talk and maybe they don't want us front and center in the, the meeting or the talk. And so how do we, how do we provide our resources and our privilege on the behalf of others? You know, or if, so maybe we have a connection to someone like that they need to speak to, or that's a stakeholder in doing the work. And we can say, let us put you in touch in them. And they may not ask us to be part of the meeting. They just want our connection. And so like, like we don't have to be the middleman in that process. And the only way we learn what the needs of the community are by asking what it is that we can do for them rather than, you know, what do you need not, or what can we do for you rather than here's what we're going to do for you. Um, and that's, that's a, another key concept with working with uh, the, bringing the church into the world. 
Um, the next is to receive, uh, remain open to receiving criticism and acknowledging past harm. Often I feel like we wanna focus on the issue of the moment and we don't wanna actually do the reconciliation work of the past. Um, you know, and I've mentioned that a few times. And so that, that is key is that we learned how to receive criticism and acknowledge past harm. And also being called out as an opportunity to learn and grow. Um, Often we can feel like our work is a fixed thing, like we are feeding the hungry. Um, you know, but when we receive outside criticism, often we um, deflect it or, or we ground our excuses and we're doing the work of the gospel. Like, we're, you know, as followers of Jesus, we're doing the work and we don't ever really question like the criticism or deeply examine like, because I mean, who likes to who likes to consider a criticism might be true about themselves. Um, you know, and sort of being, looking at criticism as an opportunity to grow. Um, if, if someone is, is being critical of the work we're doing, using it, you know, to receive that criticism and use it as an opportunity, as a learning tool, you know, as a, as a way to, to re-examine our strategies and our work in the world as church, to sort of figure out if we can better align or acknowledge or say, you know what, we're totally wrong. We hadn't even considered that. How, and then we go back to ask, how, how can we solve this? Like, you know, this isn't a linear process. These are just points along the way. And I think the last part is, um, sorry. I, uh, ah, I'm gonna go back, is receive. And uh, remember that the work isn't about ever about us and realize that our presence or our opinions may not be needed or desired. And, and what this might look like for some of us is, um, you know, at a Black Lives Matter gathering, it said, well, why do we need you here? Like, as, as a white person, like, why do we need you here right now? Um, or, um, you know, when gender was more segregated in events like Take Back the Night marches, uh, men were often asked not to show up at the march so that women had their own space, or men were asked to march in the back to let women have the forefront and realize that my presence might not even be desired. And that can be hard. It's like, I'm trying to help you. I'm, you know, and they said, we don't even need your help. And so look, looking how to take a step back from our work, realizing that the work we do in community is really about the community we seek to help and about we can say we're followers, followers of Christ and we're doing Jesus's work, but so often we wanna put our face as the face of Jesus in the world, um, rather than to be recognized, we say we are. Like, nope, we recognize ourselves as doing the work of the gospel rather than letting other people recognize the gospel through our work. And so, um, you know, are we being servants here or are we providing services? And so that's that's another key shift in our perception and becoming a good ally. Um, and I know there's gonna be breakout sessions today. I think there's enough of us to do that. Um, questions for our own conversations. How am I reacting to what I've heard today? Um, and if you need a key, um, Second question, and these are just guides. You can do whatever you want. Um, in ministries, how might we be working from a place of self-interest, altruism, or an idea that we are saving people? Like if we want to talk about like our, our evangelical tendencies, like maybe less than the ELCA, but um, we do have evangelical in our name for a reason. Um, and the last one, with what I heard today, what are some new approaches I might try in my own ministry, congregation, or future work? Um, so, you know, how am I reacting to what I've heard today? How might I still be forefronting myself or my, my preconceived ideas in, in our work? And how might we do our work differently from what we've heard today? So there's a sort of the three guiding questions. Um, I'm gonna close, stop screen sharing because I wanna see all of you. Um, let me see here. Um, there, thank you. There you go, I did that for you. <laughs> so, so I talked a lot when I probably should have talked less, which is a tendency of mine. Um, 
So those are the things. Um, do you have any questions for me real quick? I see uh, Reverend Dr. Lawrence Clark said 12 step I'm recovering. Um, I oft, I preached one Sunday at a church in a, in a different synod um, for their recovery Sunday because um, because of some of my background. And then I gave a talk in between the services. It was a big church um, to the church council and people who are interested about what they could do for the recovery community. And one of the questions from one of the, 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 the bishops committee is it's called there. They want to know. So what is this going to do for us if we suddenly reach out to the community? Like how many new members of their church were they going to get? Would there be any money that they're going to get from the community? And I, and I said, I think, I think we maybe need to turn around and see why we're actually doing this work. Um, Cause they just viewed it as another project to take on for their church and they weren't sure they wanted to make the investment. Um, and they wanted to know what the return on the investment was for, for working with recovery communities. So um, that, that's a good point. So, and, and that's another example of how, when we get down to committees and boards and, and funds, how our thinking really changes. It's like, do we have the resources to do this work? Um, how are we gonna deliver this, this, this idea, this package, this service to the community rather than, than uh, decentering ourselves from the work? So. But it's all very practical because you can't do ministry without a budget and without people willing to do the work. So, Jory, this is Carol Schultz. Hi, Carol. Hi. Um, I wanted to touch on the thought about receiving criticism. Uh, obviously, it's a multifaceted subject, but I wonder what you would say about um, criticism that comes from a place of wanting to improve the outcome or the situation versus criticism that just wants to tear down the individual or the organization? I honestly, in, in my work in communities, I often feel like part of that tearing down is an important part of the work because with all of my defenses and structures and, and because, because we more and more we come to see that oppression is so institutionalized, like with racism, that until I get torn down a little bit, I'm not even aware of what's going on. Like, like it never occurred to me in taking a job at a tribal college that I suddenly became a guest on tribal land. Um, and and like, I hear what I you're just, saying. Yeah, yeah, I hear what you're saying, but I was a nonprofit yeah. director of an organization that literally was forced out of existence. Uh, that, see, and that, that, and, that's and that a was not to the question. benefit of the community. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, and so I think, I think part of it is being able to just receive that anger or that tearing down um, and then looking and saying, does this, like once we're a step back from it a little bit, saying, does this seem to apply for us or not? And if it doesn't, moving beyond that to, to what we do consider to be important. And, you know, our job isn't always to, there's a lot of rage in the world right now. Um, there's a lot of division. And sometimes we just need to be, be a target for that rage and to the best of our ability, let that go. And our job is not to respond to that rage. I mean, we, we, it, it, we encounter it, but it's not our job to, to engage that at the same level. And so, but you know, in all of our training, it says, no, but wait, you need to hear us. And so often that impulse to say, you need to hear us just spawns more rage because I can guarantee that most of like the LGBTQ community already knows what the church has to say, but so often the church has no idea what the LGBTQ community has to say. It's like, no, 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 we've heard from the church for several hundred years now. We're quite aware of what you have to say. Um, like, like one of my favorite things was the American Council of Bishops for the Catholic Church um, had new policy or guidelines for um, families and dealing with LGBTQ family members, but they did not consult with a single LGBTQ person. They just, they just made a policy. And so, so in that sort of like move is like maybe p accepting part of that rage as part of our listening process. Um, just, just hearing that out without a need to respond. And that can be so, that can be some of the most difficult work that we have to do. So it sounds like simply empathizing, just simply listening to people 
And again, yeah, I, I, as if, if, if it's aimed at you personally, but you're, you're really listening and paying attention so that the person can um, verbalize um, the, you know, what they're, what they're going through and, and, and the, the anger. And sometimes it's just speaking that, you know, speaking that and then, and then being able to say, I heard what you said. Um, and that upsets me, you know, that makes me upset. Um, just, you know, just listening. So, yeah. Absolutely. Sometimes you just say, I hear what you're saying and I don't know what to say, but I'm hearing you like that. Like that has been able to diffuse situations, be like, you're angry and I, I hear you, I don't understand it, and I don't know how to respond to it, but I want you to know that I'm actually hearing you. Because it may be the first time ever that someone who's represented something that like can hear, like I am hearing you, you are being listened to. Like, like there's a, a comment a little more controversial, you know, it's like, um, but as a person, it's like, I don't know what it's like to be a person of color in this nation right now, but if it takes lighting a police car on fire, it's not my job to say yes or no. That's, you know, that's not my call because I'm not a person of color in this time and place. And that seems really radical. And I didn't say that someone else said that, um, but I understand the impetus because sometimes, like, I don't know your experience. I just need to hear it. I just need to like witness that you are having these feelings and that's as far as I can go is to do the listening. And sometimes that's our allyship. You know, sometimes that's what social justice looks like. I'm the face of the church and the face of the church is just going to listen to you right now and acknowledge that, yeah, we have no idea how to help, but we want to, and I want you to know that I'm listening. So. Any other questions? I, mean, I, I really I, I like the, um, the, the the information that you presented today because it does um, especially for coaching it does um, it does help to honor the, those facts to you know to walk alongside somebody instead of um, trying to tell them what to do but really listening you know paying um, close attention to what they're saying and then asking mm -hmm. questions about how what they might do to either improve or or um, uh, help that to grow to another level to, you know, so. Um, I, really I agree. feel, yeah, and I feel like most of you are of an age that during the civil rights movement, you know the term working in solidarity with, and I really, I really lament that we've lost some of that language because working in solidarity with is what being a good ally is. And I feel like now um, allyship is sometimes an identity that people take on and be like an ally to this community. And I, I'm always leery of that because I wonder, I'm like, did someone tell you that? Or is that just like your branding of yourself? Uh, you know, or like, you know, or when we have talking points for a church or a ministry, it's like, you know, leading a ministry of blah, 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 that does this, this, and this. And it's like, um, we need ways to introduce ourselves, but, I, but I'm always, I'm always a little, like I much prefer working in solidarity with rather than um, working on behalf of. So. And I'm not an expert. This is just part of my, my lived experience. And I see there's a question about how we educate ourselves. And I feel like we have more resources today. Like, like we need secondary stakeholders in the work that we're doing. Like if we're doing outreach with homelessness in our community, we might refer back to people who are also working with homeless and talk to them to help educate us, um, but not asking or putting a burden of educating us on the people that we seek to serve um, directly is the important part. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't leverage some of our relationships to better understand. Um, and it's okay to say, you know, I'm re having a really hard time understanding this I don't want you to feel like it's up to you to educate me, but what do you think I can do to better educate myself about this? Like asking people say, what are some resources that I can use rather than saying, okay, you educate me can be another way to handle that. Um, it just, it's just a matter of like, it's a matter of me not saying I have all this privilege and I have no idea how to help you. So, um, Educate me so I can see like you and then tell me how I can help you. 
because um, they want to get to the how can I help you part or how can I work alongside of you um, and they don't want to put the onus of, of, of the heavy emotional work on that person because because they've been through enough like like when I think about um, lots of what we some people might consider controversial like reparations work and um, like rent uh, like real rent to indigenous communities, like churches. Um, one of the practices that I've seen some churches are doing is like, uh, we're nonprofits. And so some churches are saying what we would actually pay in property tax, we are paying to the tribe whose tribal land we are occupying right now. So like, which is another form of reparations, but like, um, like asking an indigenous person to explain in great detail their trauma and their generational trauma to me um, is awful. Like we would have, we would have non-native um, English professors who would say, you know, write me about your family. Like, tell me about your family of origin. And that was so traumatic for so many students. And it had never occurred to them that they're like causing all of this trauma or causing their students to relive this trauma. They just want to get to know like their, their students better and understand their tribal backgrounds a little bit better. Um, but it would never occur to them that all of the, the trauma that comes with asking an indigenous person, so tell me about your past. <laughs> because it's often horrific. Um, and it goes on for generations and generations. So, um, you know, and and part of the college has the residential, the Indian residential school is one of the buildings that is part of the campus now. And so part of that traumatic history is encompassed within tribal lands. And so like there's, there's a reclaimed transformed representation of our trauma, which was important to the community and awesome, but also really hard because you have to realize that, well, who set up the residential school, the church? White people in the church, both of which I'm personally a representative of. Um, you know, and here I am going on tribal land where the church was and caused a lot of trauma to a lot of people, some of whom are still alive. Grandparents of some of the students had attended the residential school. So, you know, it's very close in saying, so tell me about your family. Like, that's, that's the kind of thing I don't want to inflict on other people in the process of educating me. And then, and then not compensating them for it. Because you're asking me to instruct you, but then you're mm -hmm. not paying me for instructing you. <laughs> key, key, we all like to be paid for our time. One way or another. This is a, this is a very quiet bunch today. Usually they have all kinds of questions. So I'm, I'm gonna sorry, ask all the questions. Do people have questions? Ask your questions, please. Thank you, Dr. Clark. We're actually just going to stay in this space for time. So we've got another good yeah. five minutes. If we, yeah, people just want to share together. We're a small group today. I am looking out at a window and I've got some like northern flicker woodpeckers coming up and tapping on the, the siding of the house right next to me. So, um, I just want to say that I'm really appreciative of you naming earlier that we don't get to, I mean, you didn't quite exactly say it the same way I'm going to, but that we can't call ourselves allies, that that's something that we're invited into and identified by those who are marginalized. And, um, and, and then also advocacy is a whole nother level. So um, I remember uh, in a particular circumstance thinking I was an ally and got educated on what that is. And then also got told that, um, however, you're, you are not an ally, you're an advocate, which is a different level that is walking the walk, right? Like with us walking with. Um, and I, it took a long time to swallow that I didn't get to call myself those things. Um, there's a huge amount of, and, and as a white woman, I got the whole like Karen anger thing happening there, you know, like, what do you mean? I can't call myself. You cannot tell me what I can't do as a woman, right? Like I am, I know my power. Um, but it is, it is humbling. And when we're willing to humble ourselves and not claim something that is not ours to claim, but to just submit to 
the learning process um, and being with and supporting, um, the time will come and, and we'll grow. We have to be our young grasshoppers as long as we need to be until we get told we're grown. So thanks Absolutely. for naming that. Thanks for naming it. And I'm still, I still get all angry about that. I'm like, what do you mean? I took it. Yeah. Yeah. I, because I am, I'm a fighter. I'm an eight through and through and through. I'm a social justice eight. Um, and so on the Enneagram for those who aren't familiar with that. Um, and I really need to know that I am fighting for people. So I feel like someone has taken a tool from me by not being able to call myself that, except that that's part of my growth as as someone who has a ton of privilege is to they haven't taken a tool from me it's not my tool in the first place right so thanks for naming that really important yeah. work thank you so much there's there's a level of vulnerability that comes with all all of the the ally work that i really appreciate we've had a um, a, an LGBTQIA uh, intern here for the last two years and, and uh, St. James where I serve has always has been a, an RIC congregation for 10 years or so. Uh, but we really didn't live into that until we had someone who was serving here and allowed us to be both uh, stretched and vulnerable in that. And, and I was really appreciative of the fact that the intern was also very vulnerable. And uh, one of the best things she did here was to do, uh, her, her senior project was to do a, um, an education series on allyship. Uh, and it was some of the best stuff that we've ever done as a congregation because she simply allowed people to ask what are the silliest questions, right? Um, what, do you, what do you call your wife? Um, uh, and but those were vulnerable kind of questions that people who had wanted to be connected to an LGBTQIA experience just didn't know how to ask well. Uh, and so vulnerability on both sides was very, was very good for that. And I think that gets to John's uh, question as well, um, because, it, you know, we don't, it's not your job to educate me. But it is my job enough to be, it is my job to be vulnerable enough to ask even the silly questions, uh, or what I think are silly questions, so that you can speak to me in a way that I can then take that in and humbly receive it. Uh, uh, you know, in a world where we have awful, an awful lot of uh, knocking heads of, it's got to be this, you know, to have that gift of vulnerability in the midst of, of learning how to be allies together is really important. Absolutely. Uh, I, I'm thinking about, we went to visit um, Spiritual Directors International Conference when it was in Seattle, close to where I live, and they had a, a, a workshop class on sexuality and gender for spiritual directors. And it was great. I went and um, there was a, a gay man who attended with me who was a little bit older than me and in the middle of it, he got super frustrated. And he's like, you're asking a lot of me. Like, there's there's just so much to learn. I don't even know if it's worth my time. Like, and to realize that, like, some of our own anger and confusion and being upset is going to be part of that process, too. And I was, I, I kind of looked at him and I said, I said, you know, if, if it, you know, I was like, if, if someone of color had, like, explained something to us and said, and it was complex and said, there's, there's a lot for you to learn. Would you be having the same reaction? And he was like, well, no. And I, <laughs> and I'm like, but here we are, you know, um, like trying it, just to kind of like calm him down and help him see from a, a different perspective. Like, um, and often, you know, we'll be engaged in the work we're doing and be absolutely great with the principles and comfortable in the work that when we are asked or to look at it at another another area we may become incredibly uncomfortable and so like like you were saying Merle, like um you know sometimes we just don't know we already know the things that we need to do um because we haven't ever had to apply them before in this in a different area um you know i think that's important too to realize that that some we're going to encounter confusion or discomfort or or being upset from ourselves in doing something, encountering something new. And that 
that's part of the process too. You know, not being able to afraid to, of our own insecurities or vulnerability in a space. Thank you, Jory, and thank you, everyone. Um, we're a little past time, so I just want to be respectful of that. Um, thank you again to Jory for being with us today. Uh, thank you for this fruitful conversation, everyone. Uh, please join us next week as we bring back Reverend Solvay Nielsen Gooden to share about another gate in the sacred work of grief. Um, Deacon Tammy and I will stay on for an extra 30 minutes. I think Jory is able to join us for part of that if you want to join us for that. Um, otherwise, we hope you have a, I'm not sure how to say this, but Good holiday if you're celebrating the holiday, or we want to honor the day of mourning if you are also um, doing that in solidarity with Indigenous and Native people. And we will see you again soon. Thank you all. <laughs>